Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankarayas Academy. Displayed are the list of news articles taken for today's analysis and the page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping of the discussed articles are provided in the description and also in the comment section. Now let's move on to the analysis of first news article. These news articles are with reference to the US Taliban peace deal. As already announced by the United States, the US Taliban peace deal has been signed yesterday to put an end to the 18 year long Afghan war since the year 2001. This topic is mainly important from the international relations perspective. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this discussion is highlighted here for your reference. So this US Taliban peace deal was not signed in Afghanistan. It was signed in Qatar's capital Doha. It was signed by US Special Envoy Zalmay Khalilzad from the side of United States and from the side of Taliban it was signed by Taliban political chief Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar. Today we will focus more on the agreement or the peace deal that is signed between US and Taliban. Obviously from tomorrow we will have number of editorial articles. So we will discuss them based on priority and preferences of the news articles of those particular days. We know that United States military has been engaged in Afghanistan since 2001 after the 9-11 attacks in 2001. So after the 2001 attacks there has been presence of US military in Afghanistan. According to United States government sources, the US has approximately 14,000 troops or soldiers in Afghanistan. Generally, these troops are engaged in two missions. One is with respect to counter-terrorism and the other is called as resolute support mission. And the counter-terrorism mission is called as bilateral counter-terrorism mission. This mission is carried out in cooperation with Afghan forces. And the resolute support mission is actually the mission launched by North Atlantic Treaty Organization in the year 2005. This mission is actually a non-combat mission. Their focus is to provide training, advice, assistance and support to Afghan security forces, particularly to Afghan national defense security forces. I know that the United States soldiers or troops in Afghanistan, they actually serve along with the troops from NATO allies and partners. So during these years, the US forces, they continue to disrupt and degrade the combat operations of Taliban, the combat operations of ISIS Khorasan and also the activities of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. So these activities are disrupted or degraded through partnering with Afghan forces and also by unilateral operations carried out by US forces. So because of the initiatives of United States and its NATO allies, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Khorasan, all of them in the territory of Afghanistan, and because of all these activities, there was no peace in Afghanistan. So the people and the territory of Afghanistan was actually craving for an eventual peace in Afghanistan. So a new peace deal was in discussion between United States and Taliban for a long period of time. And the present deal which was signed yesterday, it is highlighted as something that will definitely bring eventual peace in Afghanistan as it gives way for a full withdrawal of foreign soldiers from the soil of Afghanistan. Now let's see the contents of the peace deal in brief so that we will able to understand how the deal aims to bring peace to Afghanistan. Firstly, the deal is named as Agreement for Bringing Peace to Afghanistan. It has been signed between two entities, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan and United States of America. See, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan is not recognized by United States States as a state and this is what is actually known as the Taliban. And this comprehensive peace agreement is made up of four parts. The first part is with reference to guarantees, enforcement mechanisms and announcement of a timeline for the withdrawal of all foreign forces from Afghanistan. Under this part, the United States is committed to withdraw from Afghanistan all the military forces of US, its allies and coalition partners. This also includes the withdrawal of all non-diplomatic civilian personnel, private security contractors, trainers, advisors and supporting services personnel. So they will be withdrawn within 14 months after the announcement of this agreement, which roughly means by the end of April 2021, all of them will be withdrawn from the state of Afghanistan. 
initially united states and its allies they will take these two measures in the first 135 days firstly they will reduce the number of us forces in afghanistan to 8600 and proportionally the number of its allies and coalition forces will also be brought down secondly the us its allies and the coalition partners they will withdraw all their forces from five military bases as of now there is no clear understanding about what are these five military bases the agreement is talking about primarily the forces are in military bases in kabul and uh, bagram town of afghan and there are also regional bases or regional hubs in lakman and nangarhar province which is in the eastern side then kandahar province in south herat province in west hemland province in southwest paktia province in southeast and bulk province in the north you can also see some other military bases of us in afghanistan in this representation which is given in the news article after this the united states its allies and the coalition they will complete the withdrawal of all remaining forces from afghanistan within the remaining 9 and 1/2 months they will also withdraw their forces from the remaining bases that are other than the five bases but this will be done if taliban adheres to part 2 of this agreement we'll see part 2 in some time then one another important uh, provision in the part 1 of this agreement is about release of combat and political prisoners from two sides one from the side of taliban then from the side of afghan government the understanding is that by march 10 2020 up to 5000 prisoners of taliban has to be released and up to 1000 prisoners of afghan government has to be released and this march 10 2020 will be the first day of intra afghan negotiations as well here when we say intra afghan negotiations it refers to the negotiations between afghanistan government and taliban and this will be as per part 3 of this agreement and according to the peace deal both the sides that is afghan and taliban they have the goal of releasing all the remaining prisoners over the course of subsequent 3 months from march 10 2020 so this plan of expeditiously releasing the combat and political prisoners is said to act as a confidence building measure between afghan government side and the taliban side in addition to this when the intra afghan negotiations start the us government will initiate an administrative review of current us sanctions and also the rewards list against members of taliban the us has announced several rewards for bringing intelligence which will lead to arrest or death of taliban leaders and this is what is referred by rewards list so the us sanctions and the rewards list against members of taliban will be reviewed with the goal of removing these sanctions by august 27 2020 and the us will also start diplomatic engagement with other members of un security council and also afghanistan to remove the members of taliban from the sanctions list so this is said to be achieved by may 29 of 2020 so as a whole under this part 1 the us and its allies will refrain from the threat of use of force or the use of force against territorial integrity or political independence of afghanistan and they will refrain from interfering in the domestic affairs of afghanistan now let's come to the second part of this us taliban peace agreement this part deals with guarantees and enforcement mechanisms that will prevent the use of afghanistan soil by any group or individual against the security of united states and its allies under this taliban will not allow any of its members or other individuals or groups even including al qaeda to use the soil of afghanistan to threaten the security of us and its allies it is actually a very important condition to taliban to follow also taliban will prevent those individuals and organizations from recruiting training and fundraising for activities against us and its allies and taliban will also not provide any visas passports travel permits or other legal documents to such individuals and organizations who may work to use the soil of afghanistan to threaten the security of us and its allies see these activities of taliban are in a way actually subject to the intra afghan dialogue that may happen between afghan government and taliban in the in due course in addition to these points taliban is also committed to deal with those who are seeking asylum or residence in afghanistan in accordance with international migration law and also in according to the commitments of this agreement so this is about part 2 so part 2 mainly you know it prescribes certain conditions for taliban to adhere and adherence of taliban to these points are crucial for us its allies and coalition to leave completely from afghanistan 
and this is about part 2 and as we saw already part 3 is intra afghan dialogue and part 4 states that as part of intra afghan dialogue and negotiations permanent and comprehensive ceasefire will be a part of the agenda and participants of intra afghan negotiations they will discuss the date and modalities of a permanent and comprehensive ceasefire so these are about the four important parts of the us taliban peace deal so in this way this agreement seems to achieve a lasting peace in afghanistan and it will require patience and compromise from all parties so after the signing of this agreement the taliban's chief negotiator has hailed february 29 2020 as the day of victory in afghanistan's long history of rippling foreign powers and in line with this agreement the government of afghanistan has said that it is ready to negotiate and to conclude a ceasefire with taliban and afghan government has also confirmed its support for the phased withdrawal of united states and its coalition forces from afghanistan and separately nato has also pledged to adjust the coalition troop levels in the first phase of withdrawal that is in the first 135 days so according to the news article approximately around 16000 troops of nato coalition are present in afghan now this number will be brought down to 12000 and it will be totally removed in a phased manner if taliban acts according to part 2 of the agreement so these are the crucial parts and important provisions of the much talked about deal between us and taliban in the subsequent days through the analysis of editorial articles we'll discuss the implications to india and various other members in south asian region and also so around the globe now let's move on to the analysis of next news article this news article is about introduction of african cheetahs in a suitable habitat in india the most likely habitat where it could be introduced is expected to be the kuno palpur wildlife sanctuary in madhya pradesh Now on 29th January 2020 we have discussed about cheetah african cheetah asiatic cheetah we discussed why asiatic cheetah became extinct in our country we saw a few benefits of introduction of cheetah and steps taken by government of india for the introduction of african cheetah and the chronology of it on that day today we'll discuss few important information pertaining to lacons and steps which have to be taken to manage or handle this reintroduction the article puts forward the suggestions given by a scientist from the organization called as laboratory for conservation of endangered species see this lacons or the laboratory for conservation of endangered species it is a dedicated facility of center for cellular and molecular biology of csir it is located in hyderabad and it works with the support of government agencies like department of biotechnology of government of india central zoo authority csir and also state government of andhra pradesh its objective is to promote excellence in conservation biotechnology and to serve for conservation of endangered wildlife in india one of the very important roles performed by lacons is playing instrumental role in reintroduction of mouse deer in nehru zoological park hyderabad the nehru zoological park authorities have worked together with the conservationists from lacons for the captive breeding of mouse deer see when we say captive breeding it is the process of breeding of wild animals in human controlled environments say for example in wildlife sanctuaries or zoos and once their natural habitat to support their population increases they will be released in wild or adaptable habitats the news article also talks about national genetic wildlife bank see india's first national genetic wildlife bank is located in lacons they are saying so far around genetic resources from 23 species of indian wild animals have been collected and preserved in this bank it includes animals such as red panda pig me hog asiatic lion gharials etc so the facility of lacons is actually playing a important role in increasing the collection of genetic resources from wildlife through collaboration with authorities from zoos in our country now this table you can keep it for your reference with respect to these animals and their iucn status and their protection status in wildlife protection act of 1972 know that the wildlife protection act of 1972 do not mention either african cheetah or indian cheetah it commonly mentions as cheetah so in indian wildlife protection act cheetah is protected under schedule 1 of wildlife protection act of 1972 
and recently on february 15 we saw another important wild animal called as pangolin on that day we saw about african pangolins asian pangolins and one of the asian pangolins is indian pangolin and the other being philippine pangolin sunda pangolin and chinese pangolin on that day we saw that indian pangolin and chinese pangolin they are protected under schedule 1 of wildlife protection act of 1972 now coming to reintroduction of cheetahs in india representatives from lakons they are saying that it will be very challenging and we have to take one important step with reference to introduction of wild animals in our country the article stresses that india has to make our own provisions and policies with respect to our own needs and these policies have to be incorporated in wildlife protection act and these are policies with reference to introduction of wild animals from non natural habitats or from foreign countries we know that asiatic cheetah has become extinct in our country in 1950s reports say the year 1952 and some reasons were sport hunting recreation hunting human and wildlife conflict loss of habitat loss of prey and also illegal trafficking and cheetah being the flagship species of grasslands require grasslands but india is having very few natural grasslands in the present time and we also see a reduction of natural grasslands in india over a period of years and there is also reduction in the main prey of cheetah which is indian gazelle which is also called as chinkara and now that indian gazelle is also protected under schedule 1 of wildlife protection act of 1972 so the issues with reference to grasslands the issues with reference to the prey of cheetah has to be addressed first and india has to bring its own protocol or policy with respect to introduction of wild animals in our country in this regard what takes importance is the reintroduction specialist group which carries out iucn's conservation translocation program which is the deliberate movement of organisms from one site so as to release them in another site so the iucn has its own reintroduction specialist groups and associated protocols india could take various points from these protocols and the work nature of the specialist groups so as to bring its own specialist groups and policy related to introduction of foreign species now the iucn movement called as conservation translocation it aims to combat currently ongoing and massive loss of biodiversity through reintroductions for management and restoration of biodiversity what they are saying is a properly managed introduction of foreign animals or a properly managed translocation or a properly managed reintroduction will benefit the translocated animals and also other species of the ecosystems so these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article now let's move on to next article this news article it talks about a festival that commemorates the death anniversary of sufi saint khwaja moinuddin chisti this festival is called as urs festival where pilgrims from islamic religion and even from many other faiths they commemorate the death anniversary of moinuddin chisti at his tomb in ajmer in rajasthan in this context we'll see in brief about sufism and the urs festival the syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference see sufism it came into prominence in the medieval period they are muslim saints or mystics said to be with deep devotion to god these saints they rejected outward religiosity and they emphasized love and devotion to god more importantly they emphasized compassion towards all fellow human beings they often rejected elaborate rituals and codes of behavior as demanded by the traditional muslim religious scholars they sought union with god with disregard for the world one of the main thing with respect to sufism or sufi science is about the literature developed by them it is composed of poems which expresses their feelings and it also includes various anecdotes fables parables etc they developed elaborate methods of training particularly under the guidance of a master who is also called as peer sufi order involved uh, chanting of a name contemplation singing called as sama then dancing and also discussion of parables etc large number of sufi saints from central asia they came to india particularly from 11th century and this was actually strengthened with the establishment of delhi sultanate and several major sufi centers were developed in many places in the indian subcontinent the sufi masters they held their assemblies in hospices or khanqahs hospices are places of rest generally under the aegis of a religious denomination so to these hospices to listen to the assemblies that are conducted by sufi masters it is said that devotees of all descriptions members of royalty nobility and also ordinary people they came to this hospices to listen to the sufi saints 
in these auspices they have discussed spiritual matters they sought the blessings of sufi saints in solving worldly problems and many a times people attended just for dance and music sessions and some of the sufi saints were later attributed with uh, miraculous powers to relieve illnesses and troubles of people and in this regard the tomb or darga of sufi saint Kwaja Moinuddin Chisti has become important. It has become a place of pilgrimage where thousands of people of all faiths come and worship. And it is this darga where Urs festival is commemorated in remembrance of the death of Kwaja Moinuddin Chisti. And Kwaja Moinuddin Chisti belongs to one lineage among several influential lineages or orders of Sufism in India. And his lineage, which is also called a silsila, is Chisti Silsila. Now this Chisti Silsila was established by Kwaja Moinuddin Chisti and it has some of the important teachers such as Kutbuddin Bakhtiyar Kaki of Delhi, then Baba Farid of Punjab, then Kwaja Nizamuddin Auliya of Delhi, then Bandana Vas Jisudaras of uh, Gulbarga. And sources say that Kwaja Moinuddin Chisti died in Ajmer in 1236 AD and afterwards Ajmer Darga was constructed in this place. So these are about the information with reference to the analysis of this news article. News article states that due to tense relations between India and Pakistan, last two years pilgrims from Pakistan could not arrive in Ajmer to attend the Urs festival to commemorate the death of the Sufi saint. However, this year around 212 pilgrims from Pakistan have arrived. This is a part of cultural relations with reference to India-Pakistan relations. Now let's move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article is about life mission in the state of Kerala. If you see in UPSC 2019 mains exam in GS paper 3, I have asked a question with reference to an initiative of state government. And in 2019, they asked with reference to Cyberdome project of Kerala government. The question is, what is Cyberdome project? Explain how it can be useful in controlling internet crimes in India. So the state government initiatives are also important in this regard with reference to our preparation. So it is important for us to know and be updated about some of the important state social sector initiatives. So in this analysis, we'll discuss about this life mission. The syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. See, LIFE stands for Livelihood Inclusion and Financial Empowerment. It is a project implemented by state state government of Kerala. This project was launched in November 2016. It is a massive housing campaign to build houses for families without land or families without housing. Here emphasis will be on financial empowerment and also on providing means of livelihood. So the aim is to provide safe and decent housing within five years for those beneficiaries who actually live on their own so that they will be part of the community and also they will benefit from various social welfare schemes. So the people who are actually homeless, they will be provided modern housing complexes with provisions for various social services such as primary health care, care systems for old age people, skill development and also provision for financial services inclusion. Now let's see who are the beneficiaries of the scheme. See homeless persons, landless and houseless people, people who are unable to complete housing and people who have inadequate housing and people who have temporary housing on the outskirts or people who have temporary housing on coastal areas or garden areas. They are the beneficiaries of the scheme and this scheme prescribes a priority or preference to be given to a section of society we have given this image this image is actually the list of persons who are to be given priority in this life mission and one special feature about this priority list is the inclusion of unmarried mothers usually unmarried mothers or unwed mothers are neglected in the society which is patriarch so majority of vulnerable sections of the society are prioritized in the scheme the finance for this life mission is received from the proceeds of local self-governments plan allocation then from corporate social responsibility fund and then also from credit available through Kerala Infrastructure Investment Fund Board. Under this mission, public housing assistance of rupees 4 lakh will be given to individual families and with respect to beneficiary belonging to the population of scheduled tribe category. Here, even though the construction cost is more than 4 lakh rupees, the actual construction cost will be given to to the beneficiary. This is one of the special feature of this life mission. The mission aims to complete the project in three phases. In first phase, the plan is to complete construction of incomplete houses of previous housing schemes. In the second phase, the plan is to construct 400 square feet houses for newly identified beneficiaries. 
and in the third phase the plan is to construct housing complexes for landless beneficiaries so these are some of the information with reference to the livelihood inclusion and financial empowerment mission of kerala the news article mentions about phase 2 of this life mission it says that around 2 lakh beneficiaries have got their houses under this life mission and this question is with reference to red pandas they have given four statements and they are asking which of the statements given above is or are correct in today's newspaper there is a snippet article with respect to red pandas in the science and technology column what they are saying is according to chinese researchers there are two species of red pandas one of them is chinese red panda and the other is himalayan red panda previously they were considered to be same species with variations however the genetic evidence analyzed in the research it shows that these two species they are completely different rather than the variations in a single species normally red panda is slightly larger than a domestic cat but has a bear like body with thick reddish brown fur also called as thick russet now scientists are saying that chinese red pandas they have redder fur while himalayan pandas they have whiter face in comparison with chinese red pandas and according to researchers the himalayan red panda needs more urgent protection because of two reasons one is because of lower genetic diversity and the other is small population size now come to the first statement it states it is a small arboreal mammal now this statement is correct red panda is a mammal and it is arboreal meaning they live in trees these are very skillful and acrobatic animals they mainly eat bamboo they also eat uh, fruits roots eggs etc the name panda is said to have come from the nepali word ponya which means bamboo or a plant eating animal which means bamboo or plant eating animal come to the second statement it states that it is found in india and a state animal of meghalaya see almost 50% of red pandas habitat is in eastern himalayas within eastern himalayas they are found in the forests of india nepal bhutan and they are also found in northern mountains of myanmar and southern china so the first part of second statement is correct it generally lives at an altitude of 2200 to 4800 meters and they live in mixed deciduous forests and in coniferous forests with dense bamboo with reference to india it is found in sikkim western arunachal pradesh darjeeling district of west bengal and in parts of meghalaya now the second part of second statement is wrong because red panda is the state animal of sikkim not meghalaya the state animal of meghalaya is clouded leopard therefore second statement is incorrect so you can eliminate options a and options b Now come to the third statement it states that spread of agriculture is a reason for decline in its population this statement is correct because of agriculture and because of logging of trees their natural space in their living habitats is actually shrinking therefore they are victims of deforestation and they are also victims of spread of agriculture and deforestation leads to loss of nesting trees and loss of bamboo so there is loss of habitat because of deforestation as well other threats we can see hunting they are illegally hunted for its fur particularly in southwest china and myanmar their bushy tail are legally used to produce hats this is one of the reasons again why they are hunted and they are often killed when they get caught in traps meant for other animals So the third statement is correct and fourth statement states it is protected under wildlife protection act of 1972 now this red panda has to be protected from all its threats and if you see IUCN red list of threatened species it is listed as endangered and indian wildlife act that is indian wildlife protection act of 1972 it protects red panda under schedule 1 so the fourth statement is correct and it is also included in appendix 1 of cites convention so these are some of the important information with respect to red panda which we have learnt along with this question so the correct answer for this question is option c 1 3 and 4 only statement 2 is incorrect this question is with reference to major non nato ally status they have given two statements and are asking which of the statements given above are incorrect first statement it is a designation under united states law that provides foreign partners with certain benefits in the areas of defense trade and security cooperation this statement is correct 
see this status or this designation as major non nato ally is a powerful symbol of close relationship which united states shares with the designated countries according to us government this status demonstrates deep respect from united states for the friendship of countries to which the status is extended it provides military and economic privileges and benefits with respect to defense trade and security cooperation however it does not entail any security commitment to the designated country now come to the second statement india has been designated as major non nato ally this statement is incorrect now this question becomes part of the analysis with respect to us taliban peace deal because we discuss about afghanistan in this peace deal afghanistan is designated as a major non nato ally and it is one of the reasons why united states government is supporting afghan government in counter terrorism initiatives and india is not designated as one such ally so only the second statement is incorrect here so the correct answer is option b two only in this question they have given three statements asking which of the statements given above are correct first statement khwaja moinuddin chisti is the founder of chisti silsila of sufism in india see there are some important influential orders of sufism in india one among the important lineage or silsila is chisti silsila which is established by khwaja moinuddin chisti of ajmer the first statement is correct so you can eliminate option c our second statement he was a contemporary of mughal emperor humayun moinuddin chisti lived during 12th and 13th centuries according to historical evidences humayun mughal ruler lived during 16th century the second statement is incorrect so you eliminate option b now come to the third statement the urs fair in ajmer is the largest sufi festival in india this statement is correct see this fair or festival it observes the death anniversary of sufi saint khwaja moinuddin chisti it is an annual event and according to government of rajasthan it is the largest muslim fair in india the celebrations in this festival they continue for a period of 6 days commencing with the hoisting of a white flag on the tomb of the sufi saint by the representative successor of chisti silsila order So here only the second statement is incorrect therefore the correct answer is option D 1 and 3 only this question is with reference to life mission called as livelihood inclusion and financial empowerment mission life mission sometimes seen in news is a scheme by ministry of science and technology government of india to promote maternal and child health and develop prediction tools for preterm birth this option talks about garbhini mission under atal jai anushandan biotech mission of government of india this mission is called as atal jai anushandan biotech mission unati undertaking nationally relevant technology innovation option b a welfare scheme by state government of odisha that provides assistance assistance for livelihood and income augmentation for farmers this system is called as kaliya scheme expanded as krushak assistance for livelihood and income augmentation the correct answer for this question is option d a comprehensive housing security scheme of state government of kerala that aims to provide safe and decent housing for targeted beneficiaries this question is with reference to animals and their iucn status which of the pairs given above are incorrect Gharial is a critically endangered animal as per IUCN red data book this as per IUCN red list of threatened species now this red list categorizes species into several categories data deficient to understand the species least concern near threatened vulnerable endangered critically endangered extinct in the wild and extinct see gharial is a critically endangered animal so it is incorrectly matched so eliminate option c now second one mouse deer the species mentioned in schedule 1 of wildlife protection act is listed as least concern by iucn so this is also incorrectly matched pygmy hog is a mammal like mouse deer it is critically endangered so only pygmy hog is correctly matched and gharial and mouse deer are incorrectly matched so the correct answer is option d 1 and 2 only and gharial is a reptile see this mains question in gs paper 2 what is life mission explain how it can help india in achieving one of the directive principles of state policy that is to secure the distribution of ownership and control of material resources of the community to subserve the common good now you may write your answers and take a picture or convert it into pdf and upload it into your drive and you may share the link in the comment section so that we can provide you feedback in a reasonable time frame with this we come to the end of today's the hindu news analysis if you like the video click the like button comment share and subscribe to shankaraya's academy youtube channel for more updates and content on civil service exam preparation we'll meet you tomorrow <music>